plus John Jay. And then in um, 1926, you talk about ghosts, Harry Houdini actually performed it. I think uh, you can search it on Google. It will show you that Harry Houdini performed. He was submerged for 90 minutes. He came out, so I think he may have been. So lots of famous people. And then in 1978, it became a cholera town. And that's where it became a very hardcore, organized, local 60s union hotel. Show you how many of you remember Statler Dining Hall in, in Xavier. So 
Stafford Dining Hall no longer exists. Uh, we completely retrofitted that space with a state-of-the-art uh, first class uh, lab. Now when I say lab, it's a works and classroom. Actually, it's being utilized tonight for the Johnson Lewis Board of Trustees uh, meeting uh, to show off that space, and, uh, and we're thrilled for that. Um, we've hosted conferences. It also plays home to uh, many of our classes, uh, but it really, most importantly, gives us a brand identity, and I think keeps us relevant and fresh uh, in terms of delivering a competitive product in the marketplace, so we're really proud of that. Uh, we're also entering our second year of our partnership with uh, TD Garden and the Boston Again, you talk about um, a competitive advantage. That's been another uh, really unbelievable development that our students have benefited from. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Julia Viscardi Smalley, uh, took her class, uh, her small class of PD students in TD Garden today to present uh, their work from this previous, from the fall term, uh, to TD, Ga to TD uh, Garden executives. And in fact, one of the um, audience members today was Bianca Sapola, who was in that class in the spring, and as a result of being in the class and in association with TD Garden professional, uh, professionals and executives, was offered an internship. So that's, I think that speaks to um, you know, really the game-changing forward momentum that we're, we're starting to see, uh, and, and I think that's a testament to our leadership at the university, and couldn't be more proud to be a part of that. Um, in terms of the academic major, you know, we, we have to stay relevant, so seen as uh, a brand identity is changing uh, a little bit for fall 2020. And as some of you are aware, we're, we're transitioning from three 11 week terms to the more customary semester model. Still no classes on Fridays, so you'd be happy to hear that. Uh, so we can add that to our marketing pitch. But uh, we're, we're really, that, that will, I think, provide a more fruitful and enriching experience for our students in terms of the experiential component in terms of internships and, and those experiential learning-based uh, projects. Uh, but we will uh, now have standalone majors in sport management and event management. And, and I think that speaks to the maturity of those respective industries and disciplines. Uh, specifically, you know, event tonight, you're gonna hear a lot about that. Uh, the event industry is, is thriving and it continues to diversify and mature. Uh, and we feel like we've really delivered a, a curriculum that and, and speaks to uh, every element that a, a, an event planner needs. And our industry partners are really thrilled for that uh, because they, we, we are, we are um, you know, one of the few programs in the country that specialize in, in the event piece. And, and I think that's where we can find our niche and really grow our brand identity uh, as pertains to events. Uh, we're actually thrilled to also be adding graduate programming grad program in sport leadership, uh, which we're thrilled about, and we'll be adding uh, an MBA with an event, uh, event leadership concentration for fall 2020, and a full MS in event leadership for fall 2021. Um, so a lot of really great developments that we are thrilled uh, to, to share with our students and with our alums. I uh, couldn't be more proud to, to be part of the, the Johnson Wells family. Um, so this is an exciting night tonight. Some of our best and brightest alums, uh, and I'm happy at this moment to, to introduce them to come up, and that will be followed by our, our panel discussion, in which we'll really get into uh, some interesting content um, specific to uh, the sports entertainment and, and event field. So, uh, without further ado, um, Sheila, uh, Sheila Demore, class of 19, uh, class of 16, rather. Seems like you just graduated. Um, head of marketing and assistant manager for Hero Heroic Records. Come on up, Sheila. Thank you. We have Bianca Francois, class of uh, 2012. Uh, Bianca is a freelance event producer. Uh, come on up, Bianca. Thank you. Diana <laughs> Kurz, class of 93. I know she doesn't look it. <laughs> she is the senior catering sales executive for New York Marriott Eastside. Just, just <laughs> and uh, last but not least, Peter Matra, class of 94, district manager, sports and entertainment uh, for New York Division of Aramark. Uh, Peter. Thank you. 
you all for, for joining us on the panel this evening. Uh, so what we'd like to start out by asking you, Sheila, if you could start us off. Uh, could you please give us a brief overview of your role and tell us what a day in the life consists uh, of you at Hello? Sure. Basically, uh, what that means is as the head of marketing, I'm overseeing all of the releases and making sure that um, you know we have amazing marketing plans and that we're pitching to all the DSPs and for all the marketing opportunities, radio, everything like that. And then um, on the artist management side, I'm doing everything for artist management. So like product management on the label side and then artist management, day-to-day -day management, um, which encompasses a lot. I can't really tell you everything, but that's a brief description of my role. Great. Thanks, Sheila. Bianca? Hi, I'm Bianca. Um, I currently work with Ryan Hom. I'm on the production management team for MTV's Wall and Out. Um, I am a freelance event producer and I freelance in production management as well. Um, a day in the life for me differs depending on what job I'm currently working on. Right now with Wall and Out, we are getting ready to gear up to go shoot in Atlanta for a month. Um, we're leaving on so right now, my role kind of make sure is making sure that all of our crew is being paid, our stages are being built, making sure our vendors are being paid out correctly. Um, a lot of the logistics and operational components that go into making sure a show is being able to be run. Right. Great, thank you. I went to go work at Nickelodeon for a year and a half. Um, 
building and production management. And I worked in TV for about two years until I decided I really wanted to use my degree and go back into event management. Um, so I went to a luxury catering company called Creative Edge Party. And I was with them for about two years and I was decided I wanted to freelance. I wanted to try different aspects. Um, so right now I've been freelancing for about a full year. Um, I've worked back in hospitality, planning galas, and then I've also worked back in television, now with Wall and Out and with fashion shows for um, Tom and Wendell. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. So my career, when after I graduated in 93, I got a job at the Marriott Marquis Pastry Shop in Times Square, and I thought, this is it. This is exactly what I want to do. I have the best job in the world. I'm never going to do anything else. So in my mind, I was never going to wear a suit. I was never going to sit behind a desk. I was going to be in the kitchen. So after five years of working at the Marriott Marquis, the Brooklyn Marriott opened, and I was tapped to go do the pastry show. Fabulous. Continuing my career. I'm in the kitchen. I have my dream job. And about two years after we opened, I was coming back from our banquet event meeting. And Mr. David Stalker, who I was director of sales at the time, sales for about five years. I did events for three years, and then I came back to the Marriott Marquis in 2008, and back to catering sales, and uh, came over to this hotel. So it's been a very interesting ride. The interesting thing was, back then, you didn't make those type of leaps. You stayed in your role. It was very rare that you would see somebody go from the kitchen into sales or into events. So I am very grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. I'm very grateful to David for having the faith in me, and 20 years later, here we are back at the So I graduated in 1994. Um, I did the prerequisite, you know, internships at the. Uh, I think we were at the Seacomp Inn. I think, right, Josh? Yeah. <laughs> um, did an externship at the Hyatt down in Hilton Head, South Carolina, between my junior year and senior year. And I think I realized somewhere around there that I didn't want to be in hotels. Uh, my degree was in hospitality sales and meeting management. Bachelor's was in hospital uh, hotel and restaurant management. So when I got out of, the, out of school, um, I moved down to South Carolina and got into the restaurant business. And I was working in privately owned restaurants, and I did that for about five years. And then two guys that I was working with for a very long time, we opened up our own restaurant. And it was a casual fun dining restaurant. We had a ballroom upstairs, an old Elks Lodge. It was a cool building. Uh, casual fun dining, 150 seat restaurant, and a ballroom upstairs. And we did you know, some, some catering weddings and stuff. And um, it, it didn't work out. We weren't very successful. We, we're very young, we didn't have enough financing to really get us through the tough times. And at the same time, uh, my wife and I were moving back to New York, so um, I got a job with Aramark at Old Giant Stadium, home of the Jets and Giants, and I started as an assistant suites manager, and my career progressed from there. Um, I think within a month, they promoted me to, to the head lead suite manager, or whatever that was at the time. And then I became assistant general manager at Shea Stadium, I'm sorry, no, 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 I became the concession manager at the arena where the Devils and the Nets played. And uh, the year, the spring that I was there, the Devils went to the Stanley Cup and the Nets went to the NBA Finals. So I think I worked like 60 straight days that, that spring. Um, and then after that, I got promoted to assistant general manager at Old Shea Stadium, then back to Giant Stadium as assistant general manager and then became general manager. And I was there for my last five years where I was the general manager at Old Giant Stadium. Uh, and then we lost the club. They built a new building, we didn't win the new contract. I went to work for another company, uh, Centerplate, which is in the same type of business, sports entertainment. Um, I ran the Prudential Center uh, primarily, and then I took on a larger role, and I had 12 accounts in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. Um, conference centers, ski resorts, an arena, uh, a couple minor league baseball stadiums. Um, and then uh, about five years ago, Aramark recruited me back brought me back to work for them. Uh, so I've been with Aramark a total of 15 years. There's a little bit of a gap in between. So I've been in the sports world for about 19 years. Um, and uh, I was brought back as the general manager of uh, City Field and then promoted on and took on some more responsibilities. So that's kind of the progression of my career. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, so 
the music industry is very difficult to get into. Um, so my story is very odd. Um, but basically, thanks to Jonathan Wales, I did an internship at Warner Music Group when I was like my last uh, trimester. Um, unfortunately, it didn't turn into a job afterwards, which is kind of what that was supposed to be. Um, but so I just moved to New York and decided I would just apply for jobs. And I did that for a, a good three to four months and couldn't even get an interview anywhere. It was very difficult. Um, and so I was just waitressing and I, I told myself like, you know, I have to waitress somewhere where I'm gonna be waiting on people that are working in the music business that I could potentially network with by waiting on them. So I just kind of like bounced around to different jobs and waitressing and then I started working at Beauty and Essex, if any of you are familiar, um, Tab Group, and I waited on the CEO of Cinematic Music Group. I found out because when they went to pay, they were like, oh, my paradigm card. And I was like, oh, paradigm, agency, music, awesome. So I asked if I could send my resume to them. The two agents looked at me like I had 10 heads and they were like, whatever. And then the, the CEO was like, oh yeah, sure, like send me your resume. So I sent it to him, I went in for an interview, got a job as his assistant. This was when the company had like 10 people in the company, which was great for me because it would gave me the opportunity to like move up really quickly. So within like three months being there, I moved up to project manager. I was managing his brand, the Smokers Club, which is a cannabis lifestyle brand. Um, and then an electronic act called Napoleon Gold. And then um, as I dual rolled as like a project manager and executive assistant, I transitioned into full-time project manager for about six months. Um, and then I realized that I just didn't want to work there anymore because I don't like hip hop and it was a hip hop label. Um, so I started doing like freelance stuff. Like I was doing like freelance artist relations at festivals, freelance um, writing for blogs, going to events. I was managing my own artist. I was consulting for an experiential marketing agency. I didn't sleep. Um, and then I ended up getting fired from that job. Uh, and started a job at a different company that was um, a VIP company. I was a touring coordinator at that company. Hated that job. So I started looking for a new job and I saw this one. It was a remote job. It was head of marketing at a dance label. I love dance music. I applied and for once I got an interview from applying someone. <laughs> so got that interview, killed it, got the job. That was four months ago. Here I am, finally happy in a job that I like. <laughs> So, Diana, we'll start with you. Can you talk about one one success and one failure throughout your career, whether in your current role or previous roles, uh, that really made an impact uh, as you reflect back on your career progression? Well, the, the major success was leaving the kitchen and going to sales. I mean, literally knowing nothing. Um, the year that I started, my goal was $800,000, and five years later, I booked $4.2 million in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Marriott before it was a destination hotel. So that was a huge success and it, you know, it, really, it really made you feel good and have that confidence. I then transitioned into a director's position, which you know, for when we talk about linear, we talk about path, a lot of people think you know, this is the progression that I should be going into, and it is if it's what you want. But I found out very quickly that being a director and being in that leadership role was not for me. I missed working directly with my clients. I, I missed that sort of interaction of the sale. And I found out that leadership comes from sharing your experiences with others, being a mentor to others, and to being true to yourself. Because taking that path, you know, necessarily, doesn't work for everybody. But having the confidence to say, this is not working for me, I'm gonna go do what works best for me, I turn what I think a failure into Nothing really sticks out in terms of individual success, but I think when I think back on my career, the, the successes that I am proud of are some of the really big events that I've worked and managed, and um, anything from Belmont Stakes, over 110,000 people, um, the Breeders' Cup, uh, NBA Finals, Stanley Cup, NFC Championship game, Major League Baseball playoff games, major concerts. Um, so those are some of the things that I think I'm really proud of that I've that kind of experienced in my career. Um, and I guess one of the, the, I guess the failure that I would kind of look back on, what did I learn from it, would be the, fa the failure of, of my own restaurant. Um, I think, you know, just the takeaway from that was just 
what I took forward into my career is just making sure that you're prepared. Um, you know, I don't think we were prepared for you know being in the business. You know, we didn't have enough financing to support us through the tough times. The restaurant business was really tough. So I think you know, just going forward into my career, I always just made sure that we were you know really prepared for events. I mean, you know, when you're doing events that large, especially just everyday football games, when you're feeding eighty thousand people, if you're not prepared, there's no there's no catching up. So um, I think that kind of stuck with me. Just being over prepared for, for anything that could possibly happen, making sure you got enough staff and product and you know every 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 you know dot and every I across and every T. So I think that was really kind of the takeaway with that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess like just from my experiences, like not having things play out the way I expected to, I just learned a lot about life and growth. Like I, I first expected to just like get hired for my internship, like that was easy. And then I realized, oh wait, most people here have like five internships and then they get hired or like have the same internship twice at like the same company. It was just unrealistic expectation. And then like getting fired from that job, the next job that I had at Cinematic because I just was applying for a ton of jobs and then kind of found out about it. Um, it, just, it just kind of like taught me how to move and how to expect things. Um, and it, and that, that also just prepared me for like the role I'm in today, I guess. Uh, where my role now is as the head of marketing, I oversee a whole department, and as an artist manager, I manage artists. So it's just a lot of like personality management, and I also maintain relationships for the company, which is huge. Um, so yeah, it's like all of those things, like all my failures, I feel like, like taught me how to interact with people better and how to manage my expectations. So of the events and productions that I worked on, I think one of the most successful, at least for me personally, um, I was planning a birthday party for one of the members of Migos in Miami. Um, we had a lot of curveballs that were thrown our way. Our budget didn't get approved until I was on the plane flying to Miami the night before. Our event designer pulled out the night before. The bathing suits that were being shipped over for our models got stuck in customs and we were having um, problems booking book flips for our talent to arrive on to the venue that we were at. Um, so just being able to get down there, meet with my team, um, I was acting as an event manager on this, pro on this project and making sure, okay, we can't find bathing suits, let's find a wholesale district, let's try to fix that. Okay, our event designer pulled out, we have connections in Miami, let's see who we can pull in, let's find freelancers to help us work with that. Okay, um, our clothes slips aren't working, let's talk to the venue, let's see if they have an extra slip or if they know somebody that can give us a slip that's at the venue next door and we walk them in a different way. Um, at the end of the day, my team was happy, our client was happy, and I think that was one of the more successful projects that I've done because there's so many things I could have went wrong and at the end of the day, they were happy. Um, and one failure for me, um, I was let go from a production associate position that I had. I just, I honestly wasn't pulling my weight. Um, I checked out, it wasn't something I wanted to do anymore, and my director was like, hey, I know you're a good person, but it's not working out, you have to go. And I don't look at that as a failure anymore because it lit so much fire under me that I was like, okay, I'm gonna kill every other job that I do, I'm gonna do a great job, I'm gonna make all these connections, and it really worked out. And the same director that let me go from that position, she recommended me for the current position that I do have, so it does. Those are, those are, those are the, the, the success stories, you know, that, that we like to bring into the classroom. So please give me your business card so I can make sure that we, we're connecting you with our, our faculty so we can maybe get you into the classroom on a Skype session. Um, so because you all represent a, a diverse array of, uh, across the spectrum of sports, entertainment, event, uh, event production, sales and catering, uh, you know, the, the uh, ancillary service component, we, I came up with um, one point I'll start off with you. Um, they're more than one part question, so if you need uh, to repeat, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, but it's always great to hear about any cutting edge, uh, innovative um, techniques uh, that you're implementing in your, in your respective jobs. So um, with that, uh, Sheila, as the entertainment industry continues to change with the demands from multiple stakeholders, can you share with us how technology is impacting the way you conduct business are there any tips that you can give us for incorporating specific technology to enhance the consumer's experience and or drive business? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, my company is just very into the whole tech world, so we're constantly trying new things in regards to tech. So just like, for example, when you go to an artist's Instagram page and you look in their bio and there's a short link, there's so many different companies that make those short links. And right now, uh, we were using um, Feature FM and Lake Fire is another company that just did a deal with Apple Music and now we're considering working with them. So little things like that that you don't even notice are like a really big deal to us. Um, some other big deals to us are cybersecurity. So we use LastPass for all of our passwords and we have 2FA on like everything. Um, and that's a really big deal to my CEO and he'll go in and check if you have 2FA on everything. Um, and LastPass has like changed my life, honestly. Uh, it's just, it makes encrypted passwords for every single thing that you log into and, and then it just like auto populates for you. Um, outside of that, like we use a, a, a platform called Songspace when sending music out and it's a way for you to protect the music that you're sending out so people can't download it uh, instead of just sending them to Dropbox or Google Drive link which then compromises your entire Dropbox and Google Drive. So little things that you wouldn't think about are, are kind of a big deal to us and then I guess just some other things to think about in the entertainment industry are like different social media platforms that are popping off right now, like TikTok and Triller. They're a huge deal to us because those platforms are actually breaking artists and we're running like full campaigns on TikTok or you know, we're paying, paying influencers like $10,000 to you know, promote our songs. So those, those platforms are really important for our artists and can honestly change somebody's whole career in life, which you would never think of either. Um, so just, I guess, little things like that. I can go on and on about tech for days, but yeah, th those are just a couple of things. Thank you. The life of a social media influencer. Who, who knew? <laughs> who knew that that was a vocation, right? Yeah, for real. Thanks, Jill. Yeah. Uh, Bianca, the concept of WOW and event attendees continues to be a major planning objective. Can you share with us some techniques to, cre uh, to creative engagement from all five senses during an event? In general, what do you find most difficult to integrate in sharing best practices with us? Sure, so to start with what's most difficult to integrate, I would think is sets. Um, when you go into a room, 50% of your guests are always going to remember what they're seeing, but more so 65 to 70% are always going to remember what they smell and how that makes and how that made them feel. Um, so I think that's a very important part of going into the event. Um, there are different companies, whether it's scenting, um, that can help pump your, pump your room with different air and different it helpful that you, if you are doing a conference or something where you're going to have your guests sitting down for a long period of time, if you use a scent like peppermint, that triggers your triggers your mind, keeps you awake, keeps your audience vitalized, and keeps them paying attention to the speakers that you have. Um, as far as the other scents, whether it's touch, taste, bite, and touch, taste, bite, what's the last one? Hearing. 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 Sorry. I was, um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, hmm, that's a lot. Um, but when you're sitting down, think if you're going to a banquet, you're sitting down, you're at your table, you're feeling the linen of you're feeling the linen of the cloth. Is it linen? Is it cotton? Is it a rattan? Is it a sequin? Your guests are going to be feeling how they're sitting down. Do you have a cushion chair? Do you have a wood chair? Are you sitting in ghost chairs? How does that ghost chair, the height of that, project to the table? Um, they're going to be tasting your food. How is that food presented to you? Um, all these trigger each other. Diana, we'll move over to you. Uh, considering the highly competitive nature of the event industry, especially in New York City, can you share specific strategic initiatives your organization implements in order to remain competitive in position for sustainable success? Uh, last part of that is what do you anticipate to the food, uh, will be the food and beverage trends of 2020? So as far as strategic implementation, um, there are so many platforms that we can use. We have online, we, can, we have our internal computers. There's a lot of things that we can do to find new business. But at the end of the day, it's really about knowing your competition. It's really about knowing who's in your area, who's in your backyard, what are they doing, what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses, and knowing how to play against them. There could be a hotel that opens up across the street from you. It's brand new, it's fancy, it has all the bells and whistles, but does it have the service? What is your client looking for? Know your client, know your competition, and that's how you sell towards them. That's what they're looking for at the end of the day. Fancy is nice, but knowing them 
making connections with them and understanding their, need, their needs will always go much further than something that's maybe new or trendy. But going into food trends, it's interesting. There's so many ways to look at, at food trends, but one of the easiest ways is to go into your local supermarket. I have one of my colleagues who goes into Whole Foods and always sees what's new, what's exciting, is there something that's being sampled. The Impossible Burger, this is something that's really popular. I was just talking to my director of operations and chef, can we do a slider station? If you went into a banquet and saw an Impossible Burger, this is something that's gonna appeal to people who aren't eating meat, and it's also something that's very trendy. So you wanna keep in with different types of flowers, people with gluten allergies, are there flowers being made from vegetables, from plants, from fruit? These types of things are what the clients are looking for because a banquet is a banquet, but are you giving them the experience? Are you giving them what they need to really have that focused experience? So I think as far as trends, really keep up on what the food allergies are, what people's preferences are, and how you incorporate that into your banquet menus. Great, thank you. And uh, Peter, as the sports and entertainment industry continues to grow and diversify, how have you seen the ancillary services segment within sports venues evolve over the past 10 to 15 years? How has the application of analytics impacted the strategic decision process within sports venues? And what opportunities within the space do you see for future sport management graduates? Uh, well, let's start by talking about how the industry has grown. Um, I think 15 years ago, I think people went into a ballpark or a stadium and just expected hot dogs beer, soda, water, um, and that's that's changed drastically. Um, you know, it started about probably about 10 years ago, and it probably started with sushi, and then it went to, you know, um, chicken tenders and fries, but I mean, it's, it's gone so far beyond that now that, you know, City Field is something we're very proud of because um, we're, we're considered a foodie paradise. People come to the ballpark just to walk around and see the food tours, um, and we, we put a lot of time and effort into kind of keeping it fresh and staying cutting edge. So you mentioned the, the Impossible Burger. We implemented that two years ago at City Field, so now it's becoming popular. Burger King's doing commercials and all that. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time um, going to food truck festivals, going to food halls, seeing what's really hot, what's trending. Um, you know, making sure that we're staying on top of things, and you know, we're implementing things that you know are just popping into the market. And, and in New York, you know, we have to stay we have to stay in the forefront. I mean, you know, people come to our ballpark expecting good food and expecting quality food, um, and something that. sports and entertainment world, so we're really proud of that. Um, I, I, from an analytics standpoint, um, I would say over the last five years, it's become a very big part of our business. Um, we've begun to hire, whether it's regional or account-based analysts, um, a lot of our um, data uh, from, from a client review standpoint, we do uh, two client reviews a year, we do mid-year, we do end of year, um, that's all based off of analytics, whether it's sales data, transactional data, all of our pricing is based upon, upon analytics, whether it's uh, pricing of the market, uh, trends within your line of business, trends within a specific sport. Um, so analytics has become a very big part of our business and um, I don't, that's not gonna change anytime soon. Um, you know, as you can see from, if anybody's a baseball fan, anybody talks about the analytics, the analytics, well, that's, that's even on the hot dog side of the business. So um, uh, it's not just, uh, Um, and we, let's just repeat yeah, the last uh, question. What do you see in, in so far as opportunities for uh, future graduates within your space and your discipline? Yeah, listen, I mean, in, in, any, in any one of our venues, we operate the majority of, of, the, land, of, the, of the real estate. You know, we've got, you know, uh, 45 salary managers and chefs at City Field alone. On any given game, we have 1,800 to 2,000 employees in the building. So we, we have lots of opportunity. You know, our business is, in essence, is food service. Uh, you know, we, what we do is we sell food. So, um, you know, that's what we kind of, when I'm recruiting and I'm looking for candidates, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for candidates that have gone through and have a culinary degree or a food service degree. Um, they've gained experience and, you know, before they've gotten to me. Um, but that's, in essence, what we do. We serve food. So, um, you know, I know we're in the sports yeah. management, yeah. you know, uh, panel here, but in essence, that's what we do. Okay. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of opportunity. I mean, like I said, City Field, we have a very large management team, you know, 200, 200, I'm sorry, 2,000 employees on a sold out baseball game. So, um, and, you know, we, um, you know, there's, there's always opportunity. I mean, 
I'm always looking for, for new employees. It's very difficult to find quality staff, especially with our specific skill set. You know, the folks that I'm looking for that you know have experience in my world is very difficult to find because there's only you know five or six venues in New York City that are you know very different than the hotel or, or that you know that may give more common um, experience uh, or you know line of experience. But um, you know somebody who has concession or warehouse experience in our world is really hard to find. So great, thank you. Uh, we'll keep you on the hot seat, and we have time for two more questions. So this will. Questions will appeal to, to all the panelists. Uh, Peter, what's the greatest misconception about your industry, uh, and how do you combat that misconception for anyone that may be considering a, a career in your in your field? I'll start with it. I'll start with a joke. Yeah, people say, to me, "What do you do in the off season?" And I tell them, "I do nothing. We just show up on opening day, just like you, with the hot dogs and the soda, and the employees are all there." Um, people don't realize. It. Oftentimes, I'm busier in, at my level. I'm busier during the off season than I am during the season. There's a lot of planning that goes into it. Um, you know, cap, you know, capital projects with the clients and planning and menus. And so that's I think that's the biggest misconception. And my even my own father, he, you know, for 20 years, like, what do you do in the off season? Nothing, Dad. I stay home. You know, so um, I think that's the biggest misconception. But um, you know, I, I think. People don't often, I, I, I think from a, from a more serious side, I think people don't really look at our end of the business. I think they look at the sports world and they say they all want to be Brian Cashman or Brody Van Wagner, you know? And there's not many of those jobs around. So I think that, I think one of the misconceptions is that there is a lot of opportunity on our side of the world um, if, if you want to be in the sports world. Um, you know, I go, to, I go to work every day at a ballpark, it's fun. You know, 3, 3 30, 4 o'clock when I need a break from my office, I go out and watch you know, batting practice. So, you know, it's fun. You know, if you're a sports fan, it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool environment to be in, you know. I've, uh, I've seen, worked, and been to almost every major event you can imagine, five Super Bowls. So that's a cool part of it. So it's uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. So great, thank you, Diana. I think the biggest misconception is that people think it's easy. That what happens in this building is easy, and it, it truly takes a village. And it, I was sort of liken it to a, a ballet. And I remember many years ago when I was at the Brooklyn Marriott, uh, we had about. 850 person wedding, which was normal for us. And we had the men on one side and women on the other side. And we had a banquet manager who'd only been there for about a week. But he saw the work that I was doing where I would count every table and count every knife and every fork because you could have 10 chairs and 12 plates and that doesn't work. And he said, I don't want you to count this side of the room. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and I don't want you to double check my work. Okay, a little bit tough for me to say, okay. So as the ceremony is going on next door, one of the guests comes in looking for table 23, whatever table it was, wasn't there. He missed an entire table. <laughs> so he comes to me and says, no problem, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, fine, let's just take care of it. So this guest, has, we've gotten this guest out of the ballroom. The next thing you know, you have the house and bringing the table, and the next person's bringing the linen, and the next person's bringing the plates, and the forks, and the centerpiece, and the chairs, and the water, and blah, 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 blah. And when that guest came back in, Looking at his face to see table 23 on his card, and there it is, and it wasn't there. That is just, you can't imagine what would happen <laughs> if that table wasn't there considering the owner of our hotel was sitting right next door to them. So the village that it takes to put these events together, it's a lot of hard work, but it's so rewarding. And it has to, you really have to understand where it comes from. And you want it to look easy for your guests. You want them to come into the room, and it's like a magician just put this all together. But there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of hard work that goes into it. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think a misconception about my industry is that it's very glamorous and fun, and you get to hang out with these celebrities and go to all these parties. And sometimes it is that, sometimes it is a lot of fun, and you do get to hang out with these celebrities. But a lot of the times it is a lot of hard work. It's very long hours. It's getting up for a 4 a.m. or a 6 a.m. call and not getting home until 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Um, it's lots of grunt work. Yesterday was a Sunday. I went into my office and I moved 280 pounds of paper. But today I'm closing contracts on a $15 million show. So a misconception that people do have is that it's very glamorous. It's a lot of hard work. It's very rewarding work because you get to see everything that you're working on come to life. You get to see other people enjoy it. Um, but it's a lot. It's a lot of work. I was going to say the same thing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, everyone thinks like the music industry is glamorous, but it, it, like she said, it's a lot of hard work and it's really difficult to get your foot in the door. Um, 
I would also say another big misconception for just like all you starving musicians out there is that you need to have a major label to be successful and it's just not true. I've worked with independent artists for the past like two years and the first time it was at a small indie label that's grown into a very large successful label. Um, and I'm, now I'm at another small indie label again which will also probably grow into a very successful label. So it's really just about like the the time, effort, and work you put in and the relationships that you have that determine your success and like just your perseverance through it all, you don't need a major label. Great stuff, thanks, Jill. So what I would like to do at this time is uh, open it up to any questions uh, from the audience for our panelists. Do we have any questions out there? relations work last year at Miami Music Week and it was at this club called Eleven which is like it's like a strip club but also a club um, and so all, all of, uh, all of the um, artists that were there were like top tier artists and since they're the biggest artists in the world they think that they can do whatever they want and get whatever they want and sometimes that's against management's policies like we can't give you five bottles of 1942 we just can't and so I'm not going to name artists, but probably one of the biggest artists in the world right now was just really giving us a problem about that. And we literally just have to tell them, like, I'm sorry, but we will give you another bottle when this bottle is finished. And although you are intimidated talking to this person because, you know, they're on the radio and they're a big deal, like, you just, you have to do what's right for the person that you work for. And I worked for the club that night, not for the artist. So... Sometimes it's hard, but you gotta do what you gotta do, and you just have to, you know, service the person you're working for in that moment. <laughs> um, it's a lot of compromise. Um, for my end, in addition to working like EW production, I also do talent relations stuff. I work with Disney Successfuls, um, Made in America, Powerhouse, and Florida Back and Forth. Um, so where it comes from for me, we have a lot of artists coming in, like, oh, I have 20 more people coming, I need 20 more credentials. We don't have the space to fit 20 more people or to give you the credentials. So just being very open with their management, being very open with them, but also depending on who the client is, sometimes you do have to find that compromise. So okay, we can't give you 20, but we can give you seven backstage and we can get you the rest of your people a seat in the show. So just finding that compromise and being willing to speak up and not being afraid to speak to their management. hotel you have stakeholders, you have managers, you have people, owners that are own, that own the building, and you know, we as people working in the hotel would like to see different things within the hotel, but we're just not getting done. So you do sort of have that struggle between the money, the owners, people who are putting the productions together, but I think what you can control are the team that you work with and the service <laughs> that you're providing to your guests. So maybe we're not getting, you know, brand new tables and chairs if we wanted them on the wish list, because it's not, it's not a budget, but what can you control that's within your power? You're still taking care of your guests, you're still gonna provide them with the best possible experience from the time that they walk into the front desk, to going up to their room, to going into our end club, to going into our lounge, to having their event in the, in the ballroom. The things that you can control are, are really providing that best possible I guess in my world, when you talk about VIPs, it's really, it's gonna either be clients or the team owners. You know, in most buildings, the team owners, they're your client, it's their building, and you know, if they want something, they're gonna get it. You know, if we can't get it to them that day, it's there the next day. Um, you know, on the customer side of things, um, it would be more our suite holders. Um, and you know, basically, if we can provide it for them, and, you know, it's, it's gonna come at a cost, and, and that's, that's really it. I mean, if we can provide it, and, Chefs can whip it up, or we can, you know, bring in whatever wine or liquor they want. It's just going to be, you know, if they want specific liquor or wine that I can only get by the case, then they're buying the whole case. So it's really simple. It's just, you know, you can have whatever you want. You're going to pay for it. It's it, it's real simple. In my world, anyway. Yeah. Great. And, and, and those of you that have been to ballparks, you know, it's not cheap. You know, it's it's expensive. So people expect to pay probably more than they would on the street or anywhere else. So.
last year. I always ask good questions. So. <laughs> Who wants to take that? I guess I can start. Um, I, listen, I, you know, first of all, there's a minimum in New York as far as I'm concerned. I, I think we have to pay like 58.5 as the minimum entry level salary uh, for anybody that's salaried, not exempt. Um, uh, I don't know. There, there may be private, you know, privately owned restaurants and bars that may not adhere to that. But um, you know, if I visit, it's all about you know, your level of experience, how many years you've been in the business, and you know, your ability to take new jobs, relocate, you know, I've found that folks that have really grown their career progression have taken jobs that may have been out of their comfort level, they relocated to another city, moved to another account, and with that, move to another company, and with that, you grow your salary. So I would say, you know, unless you, you're moving into your quote unquote G, dream job, you should never go backwards as far as your salary and your expectations. Um, but uh, yeah, you just gotta find the right niche, I would say. Uh, to echo that point, so there is in New York, uh, your market reference point. So what are these jobs paying in different hotels? How do you find out, you know, whether it's through LinkedIn, whether, you know, it's from speaking with other colleagues of yours, but something to think, like for a hotel, it's a little bit different because there's a total package. There's a total benefits package that comes with being hired here whether your medical benefits, your salary, what type of profit sharing you have, what are you looking at as far as stock. So you have to take a look at, and the job itself, is this the job that you want? Maybe you do have to take a job that is not exactly what you want just to get to where you wanna be, but you need to look at the total package because it's not always about money. There are a lot of other benefits that come with that could be very important to you and, 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 and kind of make up for maybe that 5,000 that you're not getting right off the bat. sure like major labels start starting salaries like 33k or something like really low um so yeah it's just it's really it's really tough uh i was lucky because i was working in independent companies so i was making a livable wage this company that i work for now is based out of the netherlands so not so lucky because they have a lower wage out there in comparison in euros um but the way i look at it is like you know, the connections that I'm making and the things that I'm doing are really all just for the longevity of my career. And I feel like taking a pay cut sometimes is worth it if you know that it's gonna lead to like larger things in the future. Um, yeah, and also uh, it's really important when you're signing contracts to just make sure that there's no compete, like not compete clauses, um, which was something I really paid attention to because uh, I can't work for any other company that uh, is in the management, publishing, or label space, but I can work for production companies. So in the summer, if I want to go work some music festivals or do whatever, I can just go make some extra cash. And that was really important to me. So just, just those little things so you know how you're able to make more money. some really experienced uh, sage advice and insight, so thank you for that. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to uh, invite um, Lori Zavada, Director of Alumni Relations, to uh, say a few words. Great. Hi. 
That was outstanding. This is very loud. Um, that was outstanding. <laughs> Hold it here. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Let's give them one more round of applause. That was very, 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 very insightful. Very insightful. Um, as an alumna myself, I am inspired by all that you shared with us today, for sure. And I am I'm loving all of the cutting edge experience that our panelists have. So um, it, this is really wonderful that you're here with us tonight. So thank you. Um, as a small token of our um, appreciation, I'd like to invite Liza to come up with um, a bag for each of you. Just a little something to show that we appreciate you being here today. So thank you. I'd also like to thank our um, JWU friends at Marriott, David's office, class of 88, for hosting us. Diana, thank you so much for hosting and pulling double duty of being a panelist. We appreciate all of your work. We were um, maybe not the easiest client that you've ever had. Uh, so thank you very much for dealing with us. I'd also like to thank um, our moderator for today, uh, Patrick Leary. Thank you so much, Dr. Leary, for moderating the panel. And for our other faculty members that are here with us uh, from the Providence campus, Elizabeth Panziera. Michael Gilbert. And from our Denver campus, Sean Daly. It was so great to hear about all of the um, innovative things that are happening, not only in each part of your industry, but also, um, Dr. Leary, thank you so much for walking us through all of the wonderful things happening on our campuses with the SEAM program. As um, you had shared with the group, you know, we um, opened up a SEAM lab this year, um, lots of changes in our academic programs, and just really exciting stuff. So first and foremost, if you have not been back to campus, I formally invite you right now to return to your campus. Um, to experience all that our campus has to offer, but also all that our students have to offer. They really are amazing. If you think about when you were in those seats, how amazing you were, think about that, because they're just as amazing. Um, and you can share a lot of information with them, and they would really enjoy hearing from you. Um, we love to have you back to support our campus and our students, so volunteer. If you haven't uh, been able to come back to campus in which to do that, please see myself or Eliza, um, we'll, show, we'll talk to you about how to do that. We would love to have you come back and our students love to have you in the classroom. There are some folks in the audience who have done that recently and I'm sure that they'll be happy to share their experience with you. And of course, you know, we wanna um, encourage you to lend uh, a hand in terms of helping to expand the programs at Johnson & Wales, not just with your knowledge or your volunteerism, but through your philanthropic support as well. So if you are interested in learning more about how to do that, please see us. Uh, again, Liza or myself, there are QR codes on the cocktail tables as well as out at the front table, and we'd um, really appreciate that. Our students really um, need the support, for sure. If you can think back to when you might have been a student, more than 98% of our students do receive some sort of financial aid, and we are committed to see them be successful, um, and I'm sure that you do too. So thank you so much for um, your participation tonight, and I encourage you to network with each other, certainly spend time with our panelists, um, I know that our friends at the Marriott are setting up behind you. I know you can't see that because you're facing me, um, but I don't want to stand in the way of hors d'oeuvres and cocktails, so enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks again for being out here.